sitting here with Naris Gambar of Saffron Cafe, sitting here in Bahrain at the Capital Club. And uh, we're just going to talk about how you've gone from one cafe to four cafes in one year, how you've survived that journey. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about Saffron to begin with? What is the cafe? What is the concept? Right. Saffron began as an initiative from the Ministry of Culture. Uh, we collaborated to revive a very old part of Maharraq Souk. And that, uh, the magical thing about that area is that it's, there's a lot of medbasas distributed. And a medbasa is a date juicing site. So we are fortunate to build Saffron, on, uh, we have a glass flooring on top of a 400 year, year old medbasa. And uh, we have 100 year old walls. So. We, 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 have, we have a very nice um, area where, you know, um, combined the traditional food, um, the costumes of the waiters, the old music, we managed to create something special. Traditional food with a modern twist in a very old area in Bahrain. And I think there wasn't anything in the market that looked like it. And that's where the success came from. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, there was a lot of naysayers that said, this is not going to work, that people can't park here, nobody comes to this part of, of, of town. And I said, in business and in life, there's a lot of things that you just have to take a leap of faith. It's a risk. So we took that risk, and I remember my accountant telling me, Madam, we can't pay the rent uh, you know, of, this, of the month. You know, What are we going to do? And I said, let's just wait. We paid the rent of one year from the first week sales. <laughs> So, you know, that tells you that, you know, there was a lot of uh, demand for the place. And it's but fantastic. So, so you got it right, right off the bat. Yeah. And you, but you also built upon your previous experience opening a bakery. Were there any, you know, yes. what did you learn from opening and operating the bakery that you were then able to pull into the cafe? Yes, I mean, definitely, you know, I think a lot of people enter business following their passion. But what they don't know is that there's a backroom reality to business. And then there's the endless, you know, hours of worrying, the sleepless nights, the, the staff drama. And I, I felt like I was sucked into that world and I couldn't get out. So I was thinking, you know, maybe that's not a good sign. Whereas I really learned that pain is sometimes good. To enter pain in your business is the only way you can grow. So I think I, I learned a lot of lessons from opening Jenna. So by the time I opened Saffron, whatever hiccups we had, I said, you know, let's wait, let's persist, let's move on to the next step. And, you know, I think it paid off. What were some of those biggest pain points? Where do I begin? <laughs> there was a lot. Like, um, I entered that business world with a very idealistic look, like, you know, nothing wrong can happen, treat people equally and all of that. But there was a lot of, um, I'd say, um, I, didn't, I couldn't handle disrespect very well from my staff, who I treated in a nice way. There was some, like, some backstabbing issues, there was some theft, and um, what, every incident from these things that when it happens, I would say, that's a sign. You know, I'd go home and, I, and I'd hide under the bed sheet, bed sheet thinking the problem will, will run away. And you know, the more you run away from the problem, the bigger it becomes. Must face it and you know, that's how you know. So then how did you go from one, when you went from one store to four, you have this really unique outlet. Yeah. How did you recreate that experience in these other four stores? Yes. Or sorry, um, in the other three stores. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the success of Saffron is that it's only set up in heritage areas or areas with a historical background. It's not going to work in a mall. You know, so I think we were given a lot of support from Ministry of Culture. When, when we had the success, we got a lot of offers to open in places, but we only chose the places that complement our, our idea. So um, finding, finding the place was very easy. And then, you know, um, uh, building, taking the profit from one place and putting it into the other. And it just, we started with one waiter and now we have, you know, around 50 people working for us. So it's just, you know, it's a learning process and we were growing as we go. And, and are you profitable now across all of the... Yes, we things? are. Wow. <laughs> so what would you say your biggest challenge in that process was? I think it's myself more than anything. The biggest challenge is facing my own negative voices because sometimes you can be your own worst enemy. And um, another thing is you can't please everyone. So I have a tendency to want to please everyone and, and that was my biggest enemy. 
And so when I stopped listening to any everybody and, and, and listening to the negative voices and I said, you know, I'll do the best that I can do with whatever I have with me right now, you know, and I think that was a good way to go. As an entrepreneur and as a woman, have you ever felt that it's challenging to be the boss as a woman and manage a team of men or be looked up to as the founder? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? I never felt that as a challenge. I think my country, um, our family, the way we're brought up, we, we never felt like there was an inequality or that, you know, if you make it, where, whatever area you're in, you can be the boss of, of men if you want to, you know. Um, I think I'm very grateful to be in, in my country and to be doing the job that I love doing without, you know, being looked at in a degrading way or in a, in a condescending manner. So. Um, no, I had, uh, you know, even uh, like maybe in some uh, parts of this world, a woman being an entrepreneur is d disgraceful in itself, you know, and not at all. I mean, my, my number one supporter is my husband. He's been unbelievably great and patient throughout the whole process. And, uh, you know, we have a great um, support system that is in the whole family and friends. And so. so where do you turn for support in terms of funding? How did you fund the business? Yes. And what's next for you? Yeah, um, a lot of the funding has been done personally, but I think the next step is to definitely use the services of Temkin because, you know, to put it simply, Temkin is like Santa, you know, you, you, it's Santa for any business person. You get all these fantastic opportunities and training and monetary aids and, you know, and it, you know, for no return, you know, all it is is just to promote business in the private sector. So, I mean, definitely, I'm definitely going to use their help, for sure. And, uh, you know, in terms of mentioning these other cultures where for women entrepreneurship is, as you said, maybe disgraceful or less common, yeah. what would you advise women in those other markets? Well, this is, you're touching on a very important subject for me because I do feel that my job is not fulfilled as an entrepreneur if I don't give back and I don't share something that I've learned to someone from an unfortunate, you know, area or don't know how I'm going to do that or not, I don't know how I'm going to enter that part of the world, but I do feel like the best feeling in the world is, world is when a woman is empowered and feels that I can support my family and I can do something and I can produce something. Um, my only advice is just to keep the hope and never underestimate the power of a dream. Never. Okay. Grace, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having me.